Okay, we're going to start. I'm just going to take a second just to remind everybody if you could keep your mic muted the entire time, it'll help Ms. Castle out and the rest of us. Okay. I want to introduce myself. My name is Sari Scheinfeld. I'm currently a senior MA student at the Emil and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University, as well as this series designer. The Emil A. and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Yeshiva University is proud to welcome you to the third installment of our series, What is the Holocaust Today? This monthly series is a multidisciplinary exploration of the Shoah's ever-changing and everlasting impact on our lives and the world that we live in. Each month will feature a distinguished guest speaker who is leading and innovating in their field, reaching across multiple disciplines. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Shai Pilnick, director of the Fish Center, Hodaya Blau, the center coordinator, and the students at the center who have helped make this event possibly possible, in particular, Ms. Lois Roman. This episode, as well as our previous episodes, featuring Dr. Katarzyna Persan and Dr. Beata Shulman, along with other archived content, will be available on our YouTube channel. I want to thank and welcome all of, the, all of those joining us from our co-sponsoring schools. The co-sponsoring schools are Yeshivat Noam, the Frisch School, Na'ale, Yavna Academy, and the Bicultural Hebrew Academy. We'll first hear from Ms. Castle. During that time, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. And at the end of the program, we will have some time for Q&A. Ms. Castle. Ms. Castle has a BA in history, in history from Mount Holyoke College, a master's degree in journalism with honors from the University of Oregon, and spent a year studying language and history at the University of Michigan. She grew up in suburban Seattle, Washington, where she learned to love newspapers, books, and the majesty of the outdoors. She spent time in New Jersey, in her grandmother's attic, where she developed a penchant for story. She currently lives in Eugene, Oregon. Today, Ms. Farris Castle will discuss her book, The Unanswered Letter, the winner of the National Jewish Book Awards for Holocaust in 2020. 50 years later, after languishing in a trunk in a California attic, a letter containing a desperate plea from Mr. Alfred Berger in Vienna, mailed to an American stranger who happened to share his last name improbably found itself in the hands of Ferris Castle. Today, Ms. Castle will be sharing with us her story about the letter and her unexpected and ultimately personal journey into the world of Holocaust research. So without further ado, Ms. Castle, we turn to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that um, introduction and, and I'm just delighted to be here. So my, my book, as you see um, on the screen, is The Unanswered Letter, One Holocaust Family's Desperate Plea for Help. And it was, um, I was fortunate that it, it was, um, it won the, the Jewish Book Award for Holocaust. Um, and it also won um, the first prize from the American Society of Journalists and Authors for History. Um, I feel that these um, awards go to the story um, as much as anything else. It's, an, it's the story of the Burgers is really amazing um, and I hope inspiring. So this, this my entry into this world of, of the Burgers Holocaust experience came um, to me um, as a surprise, um, totally unsearched for. Um, my husband came home one night uh, from his office, he was a physician, telling me that he is a patient had given him a letter uh, that had been in her family since 1939. And he thought I might be interested in it. Um, I took the letter from him and I, but I had to ask him and I took the letter to read it. And I um, had to ask, why would it, somebody give you a letter their family had saved for some 60 years? Why would she give it to you? And he said that this patient was in cleaning up papers. She was in her late eighties and trying to get all her, her, her records in order or her, her all her letters or papers and 
he he said and why me it's probably because i'm the only jew that she knows and and that was probably true so um when i started reading the letter i was i was just stunned um it came from alfred berger um and it was addressed to um, a burger in Los Angeles, California. So I thought, okay, these these must have been relatives. Um, and then I saw that the address um, of the letter was here, Vienna, Wien, Germany, August either fifth or seventh. There's a strike over 1939. So this would have reached Los Angeles, where the American Berger family lived, just as World War II was about to break out in Europe. But still, a year after the Anschluss, um, when Germany had occupied Austria. So in that context, um, I, I began to read with, with great, great interest and intensity. Um, the letter starts, Dear Madam, you are surely informed about the situation of all Jews in Central Europe, and this letter will not astonish you. The first half of that sentence is probably true, that um, people in America were, were moderately well informed of the situation in 1938 and 1939, early um, 1939. Um, Kristallnacht had already happened in um, the previous November of November 38, and that the, that uh, massive um, riot. Um, made the headlines all across the world and all even in in small papers in America. So um, the Berger family in Los Angeles would have known something about the situation of Jews. Um, but to receive a, a letter uh, from a from a stranger in Vienna, that would have been astonishing. The Alfred Berger goes on to say by Pure chance I got your address, and as our names are the same, I hope that you may belong to the same family in Moravia. He continues saying that his daughter and her husband had a way to immigrate to America and would soon go there. Um, and they were, as Alfred said, Alfred and his wife Hedwig, um, that they were, quote, seized with fright, thinking of the moment when our children will leave us and we shall be here all alone. Um, and then he goes on to beg for an affidavit of support that would allow him to, and his wife Hedwig, to immigrate to America. This was actually not a small request. Um, to submit an affidavit of support um, for a citizen, you had to in those days, and you still have to uh, submit a, um, your a financial analysis of, of your holdings um, that shows that you will be able to uh, support, if need be, this immigrant, um, that they not become a burden, to, quote, a burden to society. Um, and so this was not um, a small ask because someone who supported an immigrant would have had to legally agree to to support them and that these were responsible people. So it, it's something that if I thought about today, what what would I do if I'd received such a request? Um, I would have to wonder how generous I would be. Um, the letter closes. Um, with a final statement that just uh, grabbed my heart. I beg you once more, help us to follow our children. It is our last and only hope. So the question seemed to, to me, this letter brought out so many questions. It was not a complete picture of something uh, that was going on. It was just, uh, it was just, um, a little glimpse into 
a, a desperate this a desperate situation and um so i was really haunted by the letter for quite a while um i received the letter in the year 2000 was busy with my work and in my family and um didn't do anything to look into the letter for um four years it sat there but the questions just haunted me I wondered if Alfred and Hedwig had um, Berger had survived, if the Burgers in America had answered um, the letter, um, if they had answered, perhaps uh, Alfred and Hedwig Berger's uh, descendants might be in America. So, just a lot of questions kept running around in my mind as I left the the letter on my desk couldn't couldn't uh, turn to it and, and investigate it, but still very moved and truly haunted by by the story that was um, that lay behind the letter. This is the second page of the letter. Personal statement Alfred Berger included shows where that he was born in Vienna in 1877 meaning that he was around 60 um, when he wrote the letter his wife hedwig had been born in, near iglau uh, in what was at that time czechoslovakia um, but when the letter was written that was would have been czechoslovakia but when she was born it was part of the austrian empire so we know from Alfred Berger's letter that he had um, a daughter um, who was hoping to immigrate to America. And this is a picture of the trunk where the letter was stored for those 60 years before uh, it came into my hands. This is a picture of a room Castle, which is. We don't see your screen. Sorry. You don't see my screen? No, we don't see your screen. Sorry. Oh, you should have told me right away. Oh, sorry. Okay, where is um, the control for share screen? I'll have Could to go on back the very bottom. to the Zoom meeting. Oh, goodness. Okay. Let's see, let's go here. You see We're it now? Good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you did not miss much. Um, this is where the pictures start getting most interesting. Um, so I um, was able, so I began to research this, this story um, by contacting um, archives in Vienna and um, archives in New York City, Holocaust archives and started to learn that Alfred um, Berger um, did have descendants in, in America. Um, Celia Sizes, who plays a large role in this book, in my book, uh, was Alfred Berger's granddaughter by his daughter who immigrated to America. Through, through um, Celia Sizes, I was able to meet um, the grandson of Alfred Berger's brother, Herman. Herman was able to immigrate and escape to America and escape from Vienna early on after the Anschluss. His wife, uh, his family actually had an import business in New York, the Guth import business, and um, so he had plenty of, of wealthy contacts in America. And right away, he got an affidavit of support, was able to bring his whole family over and all of his belongings because he got out most of his belongings um, because he came so early in after the Nazis took over. Um, he set up in his house a room 
uh, the grandson of, of uh, Hermann Berger, set up a room in his own house after, after Hermann Berger passed away um, that was exactly the furniture that had that Herman had brought over from Vienna. So this was the dining room that was in Vienna in Herman Berger's um, home. Alfred and Hedwig Berger would have sat around this table many times, um, enjoying family get togethers. Also in the Vienna room where um, Herman's grandson, Peter, uh, had set up the, all the, the dining room, he also had boxes and boxes of letters and pictures. This is where I first was able to see a picture of Alfred Berger. This is Alfred in the back, um, probably I would guess around the age 15. And uh, here's Herman in the front row. Alfred brother Richard, Alfred's older sister Matilda, and um, um, Arnold Berger, his, his next youngest sister. When I had first gotten this letter and, and it says something about being frightened and being here alone, I pictured Alfred and Hedwig simply isolated and alone and fighting for their lives in, in Vienna by themselves. Um, here they are as young married people. I love this picture because it looks really kind of contemporary. One thing I'll point out is Alfred Berger's glasses have gotten much thicker. He had, in fact, from a young age, he had a macular degeneration and would go prog progressively blind. Here is the young family, Alfred Berger and his wife, Hedwig. Um, the youngest daughter, Gretel, uh, who did not appear in the letter. I discovered her presence when um, I began researching um, the family from the Vienna City Archives. In, in Vienna, um, all the citizens and had to register where they lived, who lived there, when there were birth dates, and who their parents were. Um, when they moved, they had to to uh, write uh, down, go to the local uh, police station, and fill out a card, fill out their their residence card of, of where they had moved to. When they had children, they had to add the children. So this is the young family uh, walking in the Vienna woods as Jews were free free to do before the Nazi takeover, before the Anschluss. Here again, I was, I had been fooled. Alfred and Hedwig Berger had a big extended family in Vienna. Here's Alfred um, in the back with his daughter, Martha. Here's Hedwig on this side. Um, next and uh, down below is um, Gretel. And this is um, Arnold's brother's son, um, Ernst. I, I think this is a fabulous picture. I really love it because everybody has a slightly different expression, but still happy and forward looking people. Um, I'm guessing this picture was taken about 1926 or something in that neighborhood. Um, I love this picture of Gretel and her cousin Ernst because they are, they look so different from everybody else. They're the only ones with hats and coats. They have their arms flung around each other. And to me, they look like they're ready for an adventure. Um, and in fact, that's just what their lives would um, hold. Here is a picture as, the, as um, Martha is a little older with, with her own uh, home. And here's her husband, Leo, who is an artist. Martha was a concert level pianist. Here's her grand piano. And here's Gretel, uh, growing up a young teenager. So now we come to the year 1938. And this really sort of innocuous looking piece of paper holds an enormously um, um, potent story and a piece of history that um, 
had not been uncovered before the, before uh, this letter came to light, this piece of this document. When the Nazis were massing on the border, much like uh, what has been happening, you know, in the recent months with the Ukraine, the Nazis massed on the border for some time before they actually invaded um, uh, Austria. And um, the Jews were um, jolted out of their complacency that, that the Nazi uh, regime could never cross the border into Austria. They all made different decisions about what they should do. Some tried to leave, some did leave, but not many immigrated to America in 1938, very few. Ernst Berger decided that he would join the Austrian army. He became a sniper and his unit was sent in 1938 to the Austrian German border to defend their country, um, again, their Republic against the Nazis against the Germans. When Austria's President Schuschnigg uh, surrendered without a, a shot being fired, Ernst's unit was withdrawn back to Vienna and Ernst, their, their assignment at that point was to defend um, the, the Nazis who were coming and entering um, the Vienna to and Hitler was um, en route immediately in his big uh, um, famous uh, Mercedes convertible. He was en route to come to Vienna uh, where he was greeted with flowers and uh, just blizzards of flowers and uh, joyful, joyful Viennese people shouting and yelling. Ernst's unit was stationed in the buildings overlooking Hitler's parade route. Hitler being, or Ernst Berger being a sniper, was stationed in the window of one of the buildings with his gun trained on the street below. When Hitler's car passed under his window, the Austrian army officers who had been in the room with him left the room, leaving him alone. With his guns with his gun pointed at Hitler. He later told his descendants he felt that the Austrian army had not um, made the adjustment from defending against Hitler to protecting him. That was a, a pivot of only a few days of a change of loyalties. And in fact, there's not much been written about that. But um, the army officers knew that Ernst was Jewish and left him alone um, with his gun pointed at Hitler. Ernst Berger debated what to do, and in the end, he felt that if a Jew assassinated the Fuhrer, uh, he, the, it would be a terrible, terrible repercussions uh, for the Jews. And so he let Hitler pass. Of course, we know now, with the benefit of hindsight, site what difference that that could have made for millions of Jews. This is the last picture I have of the Berger family together. Um, you'll notice that Alfred Berger is the only one not looking at, at the uh, camera um, and his glasses are much thicker. He is at this point legally blind and carries a white cane. His, um, this is Gretel. Um, Martha and her husband Leo, and of course Hedwig. Um, this is the last time the whole family would be together. This is a picture of Martha and Gretel standing um, next to their apartment on Schmaltz of Gasa. They were about to say goodbye to each other. Um, Martha, through her husband, her husband's family, would have a legal way to immigrate to America. Gretel had no such um, contact, but she was a member of the Batar Youth Group, an active member of the Batar Zionist Youth Group in Vienna. And the Batar, through the most amazing trickery and, um, and um, persistence, was able to um, 
negotiate with Alfred Eichmann himself uh, for these young Zionists to leave Vienna and immigrate to Palestine. Of course, the British, that was illegal from the British point of view. Um, but I, um, the Nazis were, were desperate to get these young activists and well-organized Jews out of the city. And so um, Gretel would um, go on a sealed train um, overseen by the, you know, guarded inside and out by the Nazis. The, the train was locked. It went from Vienna down to Athens. And then these young Jews, um, this young Batar group, probably about a thousand of them, were plunked down on a beach um, in near near Athens, a Greek beach, waiting for um, um, a ship that was supposed to take them to to Palestine. The ship was late. They were roasting on the on these broiling hot beaches in the summer in June of thirty eight. Um, eventually it came, it came with almost no food because the people who made the contract, um, in, didn't put the food on, they'd been paid to put on. So Gretel had a horrible trip across the Mediterranean, but she did, did make it to Palestine. These, uh, these, um, people who were running the ship were actually, Actually, their normal cargo was bootlegged alcohol. Um, they dumped the Jews off um, the ship a little offshore, and so Gretel would end up swimming um, to the beach. Gretel and Ernst together made this journey, both of them active in the Bitar. Um, and so Gretel made it, the trip to shore uh, with barefoot. She landed on the shore. Of, of Palestine, where she um, then was picked up by um, the Jewish resistance in, in uh, the British mandate and um, lived, got married by, by one of the people who helped to pull her out of the water. So it's, it's a happy, that's a happy story. This, sto this is Leo, Martha's husband who was a Polish, illegal Polish immigrant in um, Vienna. These, these Polish Jews were um, a prime target for, for Hitler's hatred of, of Jewish people. He hated these Polish Jews being all throughout um, the German Reich and um, tried to deport the Jews to, to Poland um in the terrible event that um led would eventually lead to kristallnacht when a young jew whose parents were on on these deportation trains um shot a a, a german diplomat in in paris um, in retribution came kristallnacht but Leo and Martha had once had been on that train, but had managed to escape before it reached the wasteland of, between Poland and Germany. And so they came back to, to um, Vienna. The problem was then how to get Leo out of the country. He, he slept uh, in parks at, at night. He didn't come home, hoping to avoid arrest. Uh, his family was able to arrange for him to come on one of these illegal, the illegal um, ships, uh, ships of Jewish refugees that came to the Havana Harbor. Um, these the ships would unload the Jews who would wait in in Cuba for their visa papers for their v quota number uh, to be called. They had legal papers uh, that would admit them to America, but America is probably everyone knows has very strict quotas of how many from each country can come. So when Leo's ship came to Havana, he, um, the, the bribes that the Jew, American Jewish Distribution Com, uh, Council um, had paid 
to the Havana um, harbor guards or harbor officials. Um, that amount, the, the, those bribes were raised to an untenable amount. And um, the, the American com uh, committee could not pay it. And so ships from Europe carrying refugees were turned back, turned away. This, sh this is a composite picture, not of, of the harbor. Um, this is Leo. Um, in the background um, is the SS St. Louis, the famous ship that probably all the historians among you know about uh, that was turned away from the Havana um, port. And um, Leo's ship was in, in the port at the same time as, as the, um, the SS St. Louis. His ship was called the Flanders. Um, this is the ship, the SS St. Louis, leaving the harbor. It went up and down the coast of, of um, the United States and then down South America looking for a place to, that would, ex would allow it to land and um, for, the, for these Jewish refugees to find shelter. When it couldn't find any port willing to take it, it was forced to return to the place where um, in Europe where it had, from which it had left, which was Hamburg, Germany. So it had to go back to Hamburg to do these uh, desperate Jews back to um, Nazi territory where a number of them would be murdered. Some of them did manage to um, leave Germany if they had all of their papers in order. Leo's ship, luckily for Leo, had left from France. So he, he um, returned to France where the French army interned all these refugees, not wanting um, foreigners because Leo was um, German, um, was from, was from Austria at the, you know, the, he was stateless, but from Austria. Um, so the uh, French army interned them, made them as slave labor um, as they prepared for the war. Leo's unit, un, Leo's French unit went north to Dunkirk. When Dunkirk fell, his unit ran south from the north of, of France down to Marseille. Sometimes they came, they got rides on trains, but oftentimes they just ran. Um, they ran with the hundreds of thousands of citizens who were fleeing the, the, the um, German invasion of, of um, France. So Leo made it down to Marseille. Um, he hid in, um, in uh, haystacks waiting in Marseille for the consulate to approve his visa. However, his visa had expired. Um, while Martha had managed to get to New York, she was busy trying to renew all of his papers and, and um, work with the Jewish um, organizations there to help Leo immigrate to America to get his papers processed. Um, in the meantime, the occupied, the unoccupied part of southern France um, became more um, strictly and viciously under control of the Nazis. And Leo was forced to hide in the Pyrenees. So he hid there for two years until finally, finally, um, the consulate in Marseille approved his papers. Is there was so much anti-Semitism in the United States um, State Department and also fear of German spies um, that his paperwork had been stalled on purpose in the State Department. But Hiram Bingham, also a major uh, piece of Holocaust history, um, and I think he's um, a righteous, has been named a righteous Jew, did sign papers of the Jews, allowing them to immigrate legally to America. Um, on the last day that he served um, as consul, he signed his signatures down here. Um, 
he signed Leo's papers approving his immigration. Then that next day, um, Hiram Bingham had been relieved of his job for for doing it honestly and correctly and and uh, sympathetically, uh, and was sent to South America, where his career was essentially ended. So it took Leo two years to reach America after um, all of his struggles um, to immigrate. The mails between Germany and America could take months, but Leo and Martha wrote to each other, Martha in America, Leo running around France, and um, Martha bought at great expense, um, maybe a total of three different tickets for Leo to come, and then he would not be able to make that ship. Um, here she is on the, on the docks of, of New York Harbor, um, waiting for a ship that she thought would, would bring Leo to her. Um, as you can see, the ship is empty. She's standing there alone on the docks, um, waiting for him, and she would wait for two years. This is the, her own ticket on the SS Washington. Um, she arrived, she had arrived in 1939. When Martha had reached America, she was able to write a number of letters back and forth corresponding with her parents. Um, so I was able to, to through, through the Berger's granddaughter, Celia Sizes, I was able to find, to discover these letters and have them translated. Um, it was an arduous project, which took well over a year, um, done with great um, generosity um, by a, a survivor in my town, a Holocaust survivor, Hilda Geisen, who uh, had survived herself four years in Theresienstadt. Um, but she sat down day after day after day with me, um, sight reading as she, the best she could these letters from Alfred and Hedwig Berger to uh, their daughter, Martha. Um, this here is the part of the writing by Hedwig, and you can see how it's the lines are straight and perfect. There are little wonderful curlicues on, on the, these uh, Sutherland handwriting. Um, here is Alfred's writing. As he went progressively blind, you, it would be almost impossible to read. Um, these letters were written um, despite the censors. Um, where they were still able to write um, to America, but their letters were censored and Alfred and Hedwig had to be extremely careful what they said. Um, if you just read these letters and didn't put their sort of coded phrases in context, you would think they had a just, just a fine life. Um, this letter over here is a postcard that Alfred sent to his brother Herman in New York. Um, this also is sort of a bland looking document that holds a really explosive piece of information. He mentions to his brother something he wouldn't say to his um, children. Um, that is that Hedwig had just returned from Nordhausen. Alfred being blind had been able to petition the Nazis get who who would have thought um, that being handicapped and blind, he needed his wife to support him there. So the Nazis brought her back from the Germans brought her back to Vienna and um, safe for a very short time in in Vienna. They would soon after um, not long after all these letters were written in 1941, um, the letters, of course, stopped when when um, America entered the war. But they would move from apartment to apartment um, as as they were pushed out of one part of town into a to another, and then into a, the Vienna ghetto. The ghetto was without walls, as say the Warsaw ghetto was, um, and that was so that the Nazis didn't upset the German people too much. 
um, than the Austrian people, but um, a ghetto nonetheless. Um, this is the last picture. Leo had drawn this, this picture of Alfred. I don't have a similar oil painting of Hedwig, but this is the last photo we have of, of Hedwig. Still, I think, well, well before um, the times of, of such misery. Alfred and Hedwig did not survive the Holocaust. They received um, in um, spring of 1942, they received their deportation notice to Russia. Um, before that, that, um, that deportation could take place, Alfred, who, who was blind, was struck down and killed by on the streets of Vienna by a German um, army vehicle. He would have been wearing his his Jewish star. Um, we don't know anything about that accident, whether it could have been on purpose that the Nazis saw this Jewish star and and the Germans and just didn't bother to turn out of the way and struck and kill him or whether on the foggy day that it was, um, they just didn't see him, but he died on the streets of Vienna in um, 1942. Hedwig would, um, two weeks later, um, be deported to Minsk where um, a truck was waiting for the thousand people on her, on her transport. And, um, to drove her instant drove these thousand people instantly to the outskirts of Minsk where uh, a pit had been dug. The Jews were forced to undress and march naked to the edge of the pit, pit where they were shot and, and killed. So that is the story of Alfred and Hedwig. It's every time I think of it, um, I feel um, deeply, deeply um, horrified and, and sorrowful. Um, this is my picture of me in the year 2004, my husband and Celia Sizes, um, standing in front of Alfred and Hedwig's um, apartment building on Schmaltz of Gaza. We traveled there together um, and together uncovered um, a lot of the details of this story. This is a picture of, um, again, Celia. Um, and these two are two of Gretel Berger's um, grandchildren who now live in, in um, Israel. Gretel had, had survived uh, the trip to Palestine and um, these are her children. Um, they, they, these grandchildren are standing exactly where their parents had stood in um, 1938 before the family was split up. The sisters, uh, Martha and Gretel, would not see each other for well over 20 years after they, after they had to go to separate uh, parts of the world. I love this picture for a special reason. Um, it shows these this family, the descendants of the Burgers, in the same place in Vienna, where their parents had stood. Hitler's goal had been had been to um, eliminate the Jews from all of Europe, uh, leaving only a small museum in Prague, um, in memory of this uh, little ethnic group who once lived in the in the area. So I love this picture as an, another answer to Hitler. <clears throat> um, the, these Israelis and, and Celia feel that their descendants um, are another answer to Hitler. Um, so I ended this, I end this talk with a picture again on the street of Schmalzosgasse as some of the children who lived in the neighborhood. Um, two of these children uh, would in fact survive. They were, they were the children of friends of Alfred and Hedwig. The others uh, lived in the neighborhood. None of them 
would survive the Holocaust. It's a, it's a one, it's a moving to me way to think of how much was lost. Um, and I feel like the story that, that this letter holds um, raises, raised a lot of questions for me when I first, first began my exploration of the story. Um, I was able to answer the questions that I started with. But to me, this book is, is a book of questions. Um, and the questions that it left me with um, are, are so much bigger and harder to answer um, than the ones I started with. Um, what would I have done if I'd have received this letter? What would um, I do if I, what do I do today when I receive pleas? And how does that relate to what I learned from this letter? What would I have done um, if I had been Jewish and lived in, in Vienna? Um, there are a lot of very deep questions that reverberate, I think, for us today um, and are important for us. That's what I think that's one of the reasons we tell these story, these Holocaust stories, because they do not remain in the past, but um, are very relevant for us today. Um, so that that's the end of, of my talking, and I hope that you will have uh, feel free to discuss any issues that you think this story raises for you or to ask me any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Castle. Um, if anybody would like, they can send questions for Ms. Castle in the chat and we'll be reading some of them aloud. Uh, you can un unshare your screen now if you want. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we do have um, a couple of questions for you just as the questions from the audience come in. So the first question that I have for you is what prompted you to take the time to see this investigative project come to fruition? I'm curious why you decided to narrate your book in the first person and be present in it as you tell your story. Do you think this story would have been told differently by somebody else? Um, I'll start with the last question, the last piece of your question first. Um, everybody would have a different way to tell a story. I have no doubt of that. Um, the facts remain the same. They came, and so I'm, I'm moving back up through the questions now. The facts would remain the same. They came to light sequentially. I thought I would write this story probably three different times. And um, each time I, I got ready or actually had started writing it, um, another door would open with new pieces of information and new light shed on what the story meant. When I first got the letter, I thought I would write a little newspaper article, um, and I hoped that it would be kind of a bright story of of what um, what if a local family had done to help desperate Jews. Um, it did not; the story did not unfold that way, and so that story was not possible. But still, I had the outlines of a story fairly early and. After about several years, I was beginning to write a story which I thought could be either a, a magazine piece or, or maybe a book, but I wasn't sure. And I never wanted to be in it. Um, I felt that I am not Jewish. Um, I had started out this book without knowing much about the Holocaust at all. And I felt that it was not appropriate for me to be in a Holocaust book. Um, so I started writing it, um, and I must have written it five, started writing it five different ways in five different voices. For a while, I thought I might include the American burgers, um, about whom I had learned quite a bit, um, as sort of a parallel story, what was happening in America, what was happening to uh, the Jews in the, the burghers in Vienna. Um, the two families had were about the same ages and about and both of them were just ordinary working um, people. 
Uh, so there were there were a lot of parallels, and I thought that the juxtaposition would be amazing. Um, but people I showed the the beginnings of that story to, yeah, they they didn't they weren't interested in the Americans. Um, and I try I started writing it with Mao me in it, and people said it just doesn't make sense. Um, if you're writing this book for people who don't um, know much about the Holocaust, um, I needed to be a person in it who stands in for all the people who don't know about it. And people can discover it and, and learn about it as I learn about it. Um, Michael Berenbaum, one of the founders of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, um, was kind enough to give me advice at different points in in my um, journey and he advised me to be in the book too um, so that people could learn it through my eyes as i learned it peel it back like an onion he told me <laughs> so that's that's what i tried to do and and why did i spend so long doing it um, I wanted people to understand who Alfred and Hedwig Berger were. I wanted people to feel that they could identify with them, that they could know them as, as real people and understand day to day what it might be like to have been trapped um, by the Nazis. Why you hear people say, why didn't the Jews just all get out of, you know, get out of uh Europe? Why didn't they leave? Why didn't they fight back? Um, there are a lot of questions that people who don't know a lot about the Holocaust um, have, and um, they feel a little bit um, contentious, actually. Um, so I wrote this book with some feeling of anger, in fact, um, in me, that this is a story that needed to be told in a way that people who have doubts um, would those doubts could not uh, stand up against the facts. So that's kind of how I, I began to um, uh, finally began to find the voice of this book. Okay, thank you. I just got a question asking if the family members of the burgers, the grandchildren and their their siblings children were always happy to help you discover their story was there resistance to leave their story alone? Um, Celia Sizes, who ended up being the main source of information, uh, the irreplaceable source of information about this book, when I first contacted her, um, I first discovered who she was, where she was, and wrote her a letter, wrote her a letter saying that I had this letter, I described the letter, and I thought it was her grandfather I had written this letter. And I told her I was intending to write a story about it, a, then just a, a newspaper story, but a story, and hoped that she would be interested in helping me. So I phoned her, I called her phone number, and I wrote to her. Um, I called her phone every day for a month, 30 days, 30 phone calls, and uh, wrote her numerous letters um, and kept getting a voicemail, um, just a, a robo voice saying, you know, this didn't even say who she really was. She was a very guarded person. Um, in fact, she had listened to every single one of those and had been uncertain what to do. Her family in um, Israel um, some of the older members of the family who were Holocaust survivors said, no, no, do not answer this phone call. This is a scam, some sort of a trick um, that will cause you trouble. So, um, so it took her a long time to finally be curious enough and interested in this letter um, that she called me up. I got a, a voicemail on my on my phone one day. I came home and, hello, this is Celia Sizes. I think you've been trying to reach me. Um, so yes, yes, Celia, I I have been trying to reach you. 
Um, it was hard to get in touch with her. It was hard to win her 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 trust. Um, and but over time, she became um, <clears throat> my just um, irreplaceable, irreplaceable friend and um, source of information. Without her, this book would not have happened. She she did pass away um, last um, November. Wow. A number of the people in this in who are in this story um, and who provided information have now passed away. So one of the one of the issues that this book tackles is what psychologists who have worked with Holocaust survivor families call the conspiracy of silence or the reluctance of so many Holocaust survivors to talk about the Holocaust or to share the horrifying memories and experiences that they had with their loved ones. If there are, peop if, if there are people from the Holocaust survivor community who are joining us today, whether it's 1G, 2G, 3G, or perhaps even 4G, what would be your message for them? Um. The Celia Sizes grew up with a, with her parents, Martha and Leo, um, talking about the lost family, telling about their experience. Um, all all of her life, she grew up. Sometimes she said, "I don't know whether I was in the Holocaust. It was so much a part of our lives." I'm not sure that was a gift to her. I think she was, in a way, haunted. By it and maybe um, felt too too much grief about the family lost and she, nothing that she could have done about that that um, she got to know the lost family as as people um, through the, through her parents' stories so that was Celia's experience um, the Israelis had the absolute opposite experience. Um, Gretel was Gretel um, had had three three children um, who did ask her when they were young where about their grandparents where 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 were they and um, Gretel would just break into tears and cry and so from a very young age they learned not to ask but even when they became adults. They did not know, they had not really researched their, um, their grandparent, their, fa their own family's story. I think it held too much pain and they didn't want to go there. Um, they, they were held back um, first by um, not wanting to upset their, their um, mother. But also that had, that had sort of come down to them a little bit, that this would be terrible, painful. Um, so it was, but once I told the Israelis that this was what I was going to do and I was going to go to Vienna, I hoped that they would join me. And I told them that Celia was going to join me. Um, once I did that, they jumped on the opportunity, um, met me in Vienna, went to, they were just dying to learn this story. But somehow they needed a guide um, to get past that first um, barrier of, of, um, of horror and sadness. Um, so my, my voice is, my advice to people, as much as anyone would want advice from someone else, this is a very personal decision, is Hitler had tried to um, erase the Jews from history. He wanted to literally wipe out the Jewish race. Um, they knew exactly how many Jews were in every country in Europe, and they planned to reach into all of those countries and kill the Jews. So my, my, um, my own feeling is these are stories that are, need to be told. They need to be told um, for the descendants, they need to be told for the world um, that this is not possible. You cannot um, obliterate a whole people, and that's that's um, an injustice that that we don't that we can't stand for. 
Um, so it, it's a way of standing up to um, to not only Hitler, but where this might happen in other places too. Um, books are written um, to hold those memories and books and, and videos and anything written down or, or filmed uh, or taped. Um, they're, they're ways to hold those stories for the world, for your family, for the world, and, and for yourself, because books even in the in the collecting of information in the writing force you to slow down and think um and i think in, in my my feeling is that that's an important important response to uh, what happened in the holocaust we are so incredibly grateful for your work and for telling the burger story and as a sneak peek we're all really excited to also hear um from you as soon as your next manuscript is submitted and when the release date is for the next book and the next family story that you're going to be telling i want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts and from the fish center for joining us today and for sharing i want to also make sure to thank yeshivat noam the frisch school nale yavna academy and the bicultural hebrew academy for co-sponsoring this event and I wanna share with all of you that on Sunday, May 8th at 4 p.m., we'll be hosting the next session of our series. We're going to be hosting public historian, Mr. Itzik Mays. He's the former director of the museum at Yad Vashem and the founding chief curator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York. He'll be speaking about public history and the ever evolving field of museology in his talk titled, Remembering the Holocaust in Museums. What are we remembering? Thank you so much for joining us.